Technologies persist. Concepts, methods, and media of prior eras haunt our cutting-edge world. At times, they are as stains upon our vision or appear to be the result of some inexplicable inability to embrace the program set forth by our current understanding. People around the world use smartphones, but still use the terms sunrise and sunsets many years after we have agreed that the Earth rotates on its axis every 24 hours. Or again, the inability of government and corporate planners to make changes that are really needed to forestall the consequences of climate change. In neither case would we say that the speaker or politician is a transcendent being who's living in the eternal present. Nor would we attribute the nonsensical disconnect between thought, word, and action as being indicative of a childlike naivete. Perhaps these cases belie a certain blindness to the past or a blindness to the future without implying that we have reached some state of transcendence suggested by the Buddha. Someone is supposed to have said that we should study the past in order not to repeat it. But that's even more nonsensical. As in music, it is the repetition itself that creates the past. Old minds turn old memories over and over. Old cultures recirculate truisms and lies. But what is the past to the hapless material object, the technological medium that is its embodiment? We experience the archaeology of our own technological media on a daily basis. Old floppy disks, cables that no longer connect anything, computers whose operating systems are no longer supported, these objects, cut free from both desire and utility, may present occasion for reminiscence. My first video game. Or they may present case histories of the ugliness of industrial design. Or figures of failure along the wayside of progress. But these media are also strata in an archaeology of attention. How we listen, how we look, how we record and our connections, how we communicate, how we erase and put at a distance our present selves from the dread of being what we were or what we will become. Like the mirror that always casts back at us an image of a younger self, an image that has already died, the objects of our media technologies offer up whimsical, sometimes disturbing pictures of ourselves. Some technologies are incredibly durable. Formats like audio cassette and 16 millimeter movie film, both in material media and in player, are so remarkably robust on a physical level that they can endure decades of neglect and obsolescence and still offer up experiences that, while clouded with a patina of past time, we attend to in the same way that we would our current media. Other media require such a huge support network social, economic, cultural, and perceptual, that it's truly remarkable that they could endure it. The movie theater, for example. Even analog broadcasting, is, television broadcasting, is gone forever. Its replacement by digital broadcast is only a social stopgap until home watching is completely internet driven. A sop of familiarity thrown to the aging members of our society. But who can explain AM radio? The medium wave broadcast band between 540 kilohertz and 1.6 megahertz has been around now for 100 years without any change, both in the United States and other parts of the globe. It is rigorously licensed by governments through a series of jealously guarded frequency allocations and quasi-monopolies. It is as full of advertising and propaganda as the most shameless web pages. There is no part of the country where it can't be received. Despite its technological antiquity, radio receivers that can tune in the medium wave are still being produced by the millions and millions every year. Its quality is shoddy, perhaps the acoustic equivalent of YouTube. The very same radio receivers also pick up FM, which is consistently superior in tone. The same oligarchs own both AM and FM stations in every city. One might imagine this format could be pulled up overnight, made obsolete. The bandwidth could be auctions off, auctioned off to telecom giants. What are the features that keep this curious technological anachronism alive? Speculation could include 
the vast inner urban areas of the USA where FM fades, or the broad popularity of baseball game coverage during the summer months, or the rural ubiquity of a seemingly unslakable thirst for hate radio. And working against its obsolescence is also the fact of its relatively narrow slice of the electromagnetic spectrum, only slightly more than one megahertz of bandwidth, all told. What makes the persistence of AM radio all the more remarkable is the negligible technology required to tune it in. A wire antenna, a coil, a diode, and earphones. No decoding, no software, nothing proprietary, no algorithms. An easily constructed crystal radio can still pick up every major station within a 100-mile radius. The materials to make such a radio are not only available for free, they are becoming more varied and abundant by the day. Copper wire may be found by the mile as old appliances and discarded toasters, microwave ovens or landline telephones. Diodes proliferate by the billions in form of cast off microchips. Earphones are seen strewn around the city in profusion. A capacitor can be made from tinfoil and paper or chewing gum. And no batteries are required. All the power needed to hear the talk, the music, the ads is sent out by the transmitter tower and paid for in advance by the corporations in exchange for our attention. Here's a DIY um, current version of the Superboy radio. <clears throat> a piece I made in 2004, Foxhole Radios, is a series of such wave-powered tuners, each created in the image of its imagined maker. Arrays of found objects, scraps of discarded material, such as empty vodka bottles, chewing gum wrappers, broken light bulbs, and rusty nails were deployed in a whimsical manner to produce these functional radio receivers. The title refers to a World War II era myth that emergency communication devices could be tinkered together in the field by soldiers who found themselves trapped or imprisoned without any real communication equipment. In a sense, they might also be called desert island radios, inasmuch as they imply the possibility of both technology and trade far removed from the organized channels of commerce. Like E.T.'s coat hanger and speak and spell assemblage communicator, the Foxhole radios served to continue a connection to a point of origin that had been lost and to offer a proof of technology in its absence. This ritualization of activities and materials for the purpose of achieving interaction with an invisible sphere has been called cargocultism in anthropology when applied to other cultures. Thus, the foxhole radio serves both as a ritual link to the spirit of the tribe and an assemblage self-portrait of a stranger constructed with materials in his environment. If the foxhole radios inhabit a sort of technological ever-present and are passive receivers in the extreme sense, they will flicker out of existence at the moment when the plug is pulled on medium wave transmission. These devices make no waves themselves, so they leave no traces, no disturbances in space-time. Without the vast informational, cultural, and electrical power resources pumped into the atmosphere by commercial broadcasters, our Foxhill Fox Hill radios will once again become receivers for the mysterious and truly etheric music of the Earth's ionosphere, the whistlers and spherics, as they're called. By their passivity, they enjoy their happy existence in the moment, unlike the transmitters whose emitted waves expand ever outwards at near light speed. Other technologies exist in a more awkward space relative to the Dhammapada's advice. They have never had any existence, any time or place or participation in being, or vanishingly little of it. I tend to think of them as orphan technologies, ones that are functional but never found a place of their own. While they can send or receive, intercommunicate and reveal, obscurity is their most salient trait. They have neither whiskers nor tail. 
But if and when they are called into being, they radiate the most peculiar fields. And I put this slide in for you. Um, <laughs> seems to be our theme tonight. Other works created during my period of fascination with wireless transmission um, deal with transmission, the act of intruding into the magnetosphere, a spreading noise and commotion about the form of ether waves. Firebirds, from 2004, um, examines radio as broadcast, and it engages an odd device, the flame loudspeaker, to play back the sounds of political speech. The flames of firebirds are a material examination of the collision of voice, meaning, inscription, and collective space as it existed briefly in a historical moment in the mid-1930s, at a time when, for the first time, the voice of the political leader entered into the private domain of the home and heart via the medium of radio. For all its power and potential of terror, the course taken by the political leader's voice was no less technological. In the end, only a wave in the air, a scratch in the groove, the trembling of a loudspeaker. Sound, with all its attendant artifacts of recording, transmission, reception, makes this evident. The voices of firebirds are drawn from original speeches by Joseph Stalin, Benito Mussolini, Franklin Roosevelt, and Adolf Hitler, all from the years 1935 and 1936. The source of the sound is actually a flame modulated by high voltage audio fields. These thermophonic devices radiate the speech not only as sound, but also as waves of varying intensity light that can be picked up by photo detectors and as radio waves that can be received by AM radios. The system is almost perfectly efficient, radiating all of the energy applied into a signal detectable by some means or other. The sound, that sound can be emerge directly from gaseous space without a solid vibrating element of the loudspeaker has been a phenomenon noted since the earliest days of electronic technology. A number of attempts um, to introduce this phenomenon into general usage have been, have been studied. All failed. The 1924 Lorenz Agé of Berlin marketed a cathodophone, an early form of plasma tweeter. In the 1950s, another was marketed in France, and in 1967, some researchers at United Technologies in Sunnyvale came up with a way of um, broadcasting sound with flame, with uh, oxyacetylene torches. And it turns out that even the path to the audion, the vacuum tube that created the electronic 20th century, um, was arrived at by Lee de Forest starting with Bunsen burner flame and passing electricity through it. And this is from 1907, uh, Scientific American, his explanation. So an electrically modulated gas flame seeded with ions vibrates the air. I'm going to just show a brief video of it. I hope we're in good time still.
In a similar way, a later piece, From Rome to Tripoli, recreates a technology that was obsolete practically even before it was born, and centers around a radio transmitter based on the hydraulic microphone transmitter apparatus of Kirino Majorana and Giovanni Vanni in 1908 that successfully broadcast voice messages from Rome to Tripoli in Libya, a distance of nearly 1,000 kilometers, inaugurating the age of radio telephony and of broadcast media. A stream of sulfuric acid, mechanically vibrated by the voice, reproduces the interruptions of the vocal frequency as a series of electrically conducted droplets. This stream is passed between two electrodes biased at a DC voltage. Each drop directs a short burst of electricity to a high voltage transformer configured as a spark gap radio transmitter, thus reproducing in a crude way the vibrations of the human voice. These signals cover the entire radio spectrum, what would now be considered an interfering radio frequency noise, and can be picked up by any medium wave receiver in the vicinity. The piece poses questions about the nature of one-way communications, radiophonic, cultural, or military, in particular those between Europe and North Africa, at a time when radio re receivers were a rare piece of laboratory apparatus. Who was in Tripoli to receive and verify the transmission? These sound distortions introduced by this crude system call to mind the harsh sounds of Western culture falling on foreign ears. Using a stream of vitriol to create a torrent of noise may serve as a mechanical metaphor for the many manifestations of unwelcome cultural address. An interesting follow-up to this transmission is the military invasion of Libya by Imperial Italian forces in 1911. For the audio tracks, I used a mix of voice and music. Each transmission begins with an announcing sequence of alarm sounds taken from a cheap and universal auto theft alarm. There follow recitations of Italian futurist poetry, Bavarian waltzes, and of course the triumphal march from Aida, Verdi's prescient foray into North Africa, which was by then over 30 years old. <laughs> 